and sound wisdom. I am understanding and I have strength. And by me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. And uh, so let's, uh, we're talking about uh, the pulpit and politics. This is part two tonight. I'm going to have uh, less scripture tonight than I had last week. Uh, tonight I'm going to just talk a little more and some commentary. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us in Jesus' name. Father, we love you and thank you for your presence already that's here. And I'm asking you to allow the same presence that's here to move into the homes of all of our people. Whoever could not come tonight, those that are watching online, I'm asking you to let them feel your strength too. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Wave at four or five people. My God, you don't want them to get sick. Real quick, little recap. Uh, we talked about this verse, and again, many people misinterpret this verse to assume that we don't have to be concerned about politics because, after all, uh, the Lord is who you know puts rulers in, and He takes care of it all. But we proved last week in, in, in the Bible study that that is not true. And that's not the proper interpretation of Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18 is, is, was talking about wisdom. And he said, by me, kings reign and princes decree justice. That's how it's supposed to be. Leaders should lead with some, with some good godly wisdom. However, not everybody chooses to do it. And uh, but but that wisdom is available to everybody. But we showed last week that God does not put all leaders into power. There are many people that get into power on on various other ways. Uh, and uh, bring up slide two for a minute, because to me this was dramatic when we talked about this. When people say, "Why does politics matter?" Again, I want to remind you of the picture we showed last week. The South, and that's the Korean Peninsula. The South of it is lit up and, and industrious and prosperous. It's a free capitalistic nation with Christian influence. Right above it is North Korea that has just one little set of lights on in the capital, and the rest of the country doesn't even have electricity. That's how backward they are to all of the young people that are buying into the seducing spirit of our time that wants to become socialistic. You need to burn that picture into your mind. Because what you're wanting to do is send everything backwards instead of forwards. History, but we got to keep repeating this stuff. Every generation has to fight for it because this stuff is spiritually driven. So seducing spirits visit every generation. And we have to contend uh, for truth. Uh, we did understand last week that civil government is ordained by God but sinful leaders, just like the church, is ordained by God. But when people don't live right and don't do right and leaders go bad and so forth, they can create a lot of havoc uh, and damage. But that is not God's fault or God's doing. That's sin. Everybody say sin. Mm -hmm. We also talked about how God will get involved in politics when we invite him and when we engage him. Uh, because he wants to, but we need a philosophy of what drives us politically. Too many people, and this is an observation I've had as bishop, through the years, I've noticed too many Christians uh, tend to, they have no deep biblical concept of philosophy. They tend to vote, if they even vote at all, they tend to vote uh, for whoever seems like the nicest person or who, who seems to be a better person than, than the other. And so Now, I want you to understand something. That is the kind of thing that has got us into the mess that we're in today. Okay, because that's, that's not how the people of God... We need a philosophy of what drives us because America is one of the few places in the world that has the opportunity to choose and make our own destiny. And sometimes we forget how valuable that is. Uh, the founding documents of our nation are absolutely brilliant. My own personal opinion is I believe when you go back to the original founding documents, uh, you know, things like Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and so forth, I have a copy of it literally in my desk drawer uh, at all times. I have all of that with me right there. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not reading it every day. <laughs> but, I, but it's there anytime I need to reference it. 
It is simple to get a copy of it. People will give you free copies. It's free right on the web. But if you have not familiarized yourself in a long time uh, with the Constitution, you need to because those are the rules and the words that we live by. I believe the principles of it were God-inspired. All right? Now, uh, and, and I'll tell you one of the reasons I believe that is because, number one, when it was presented, as we talked last week, it had never been done anywhere in the history of the earth. The government form that you and I live under had never been tried. It was a new idea, and even the founders wasn't sure if it was going to work. And here's, here's what's interesting. Those founding documents were so powerful and so lofty in their premise that we're in 2020, 245 years later, and we're still trying to live up to them. And still falling short many times. That's how lofty they are. So the point is, is that, you know, don't, we don't trash. There's a spirit of our day that wants to trash the nation and, and, and say, you know, our founding was faulted and we're just this, that, and the other. That, that, that's, a, that's a seducing spirit, and it's not true. Uh, the reality is, is that we don't trash the Bible because people don't live up to it. We acknowledge the, and, and honor the incredible power of the Word of God, even though every one of us falls short of it. And if you trash the Bible simply because everybody's not living up to it, then that's a real quirky thing <laughs> that I don't understand. But you have to do that if you're going to be consistent by, by, for those that want to trash America and America's whole existence as being something that's been broken from the beginning. Not so. It, it is the opposite. We are not living up to our own stuff, but we don't trash the, the, the nation over that. We live in a unique place where, again, we can use those founding documents to fight our cause. Now, it's not easy. And, it's, and it takes time. And it's I'm not telling you this, this stuff is simple. But I'm trying to tell you, we forget that those liberties are very few places in our world. And I've traveled in many of the places of our world uh, that, they are, that they are not there. And believe me, you can tell uh, the difference. It's interesting that right now, an average in America since 1960... Uh, an average of only 50 to 55, maybe, up, well, the high end was about 58 percent. 50 to 58 percent of eligible voters even vote. Okay, So there's a, there's a lot of voices not being even heard. Now, maybe it might be well that some of them aren't. <laughs> I don't know. But there's probably some other good ones that are not being heard as well. In 2016, which was our last national big election, 55.67%. Um, uh, so it's been consistent for the last 50 years. And I want to say to the whole church, every one of us as ch uh, children of God and people of God should be registered to vote. And you should be getting ready to vote here coming up on November 3rd. <laughs> And, and, and if you say, yeah, it doesn't matter, well, it's, it will. It absolutely will. And again, look at a picture if you think it doesn't matter. Said, oh, that'll never happen here. You'd be surprised what'll happen here. Now, last week when we finished up, uh, we ended on a, on a video by uh, Dr. Tony Evans, and uh, I, I was amazed at all the comments I got. You all got a kick out of that. Uh, and it was enjoyable, and I, I, I told you that I would open up with it tonight because some of you weren't uh, here for that. So bring that clip up if you would. would. And this was, again, wasn't how I was going to end. I, this was just in the flow of what I was going to do last week. Go. As a famous nursery rhyme that simply goes, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Mr. Dumpty's world had become shattered, 
and he needed it fixed. But he didn't go to his friends or his family or even his church. He went to the White House. <laughs> now we know he went to the White House because the king got involved. The king was sympathetic to Mr. Dumpty's dilemma, so he called a meeting of Congress. We know Congress got involved because all the king's men got involved. When they came together, they decided to pass a fix Mr. Dumpty law because they wanted sincerely to make Mr. Dumpty's world a better place to live. But the tragedy of the nursery rhyme is when it was all said and done, all the king's horses, and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It is unfortunate today that far too many believers are expecting the solutions to our problems to land on Air Force One. They are expecting the transformation to come from our elected officials. But Second Chronicles chapter 15, verses 3 to 6, puts it in proper perspective. It says, in those days, there was no true God, no teaching priest, and no law. And so as a result, it says, nation rose up against nation, city rose up against city, and there was no peace to him who came in or to him who went out. And then it concludes in verse 6 by saying, for God had troubled them with every kind of distress. Now, if God is your problem, only God is your solution. Amen. If God is your problem, then the first concern ought not be who's in the White House, but who's in our house. If, if, if God is your problem, if he is causing the distress, then the maximum amount of our time should not be spent on getting the right person in Washington the bulk of our time needs to be spent in getting God back on our side. One of the great diseases of our day is AIDS. AIDS is a breakdown of the immune system. AIDS doesn't exactly kill you, it just sets you up for something else to do you in. Whether it's pneumonia or cancer, because the immune system is down, the bacteria and viruses are up and can bring destruction. God's immune system in the culture is the church. So if cultural colds are now societal pneumonia, it's because the immune system is down. And until the immune system of God, the church, is brought back up, the bacteria and viruses of destruction will continue to destabilize our country, ebb away our freedoms, and take away our liberty. When the question is raised, how should you vote? I'm taken to Joshua chapter five. Joshua is doing reconnaissance around the walls of Jericho. And he's trying to figure out how to take down this enemy. He looks over and he sees the captain of another large army dressed in battle array. Now Joshua's mama didn't raise a dummy. He wanted to know whose side are you on? Because if you're on our side, then we've got help against Jericho. But if you're on their side, we've got double trouble. So before I go out here and make a fool of myself, whose side are you on? That's when the captain says to him, I think you are confused. I'm neither on your side, nor am I on their side. I'm captain of the Lord's army. I did not come to take sides. I come to take over. You and I have to understand is God does not ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. Yeah. That if you're a Democrat, the best you can do is vote Democrat light, L-I-T-E. Or Republican light, L-I-T-E, because your job is to bring the either one, the L-I-G-H-T. Your job is to represent another king in another kingdom. Last year I served as chaplain of the Cowboys and when the Cowboys play or any football team plays, three teams take the field. There's the home team, there's the visiting team, and they'll never get along because one is going this way, the other is going that way, and they are built to resist one another. And there is nothing you can do to put them on the same page. But then there is this third team. 
It's called the team of officials. This third team, team of officials, they're on the field, but they're not of the field. They're in the middle of the chaos, but they don't belong to the chaos because they belong to another kingdom called the NFL. They belong to another arena. Their job is not to listen to the roar of the crowd, boo they, be they boos or cheers, or to the fractions that are against each other because they've been handed a book. And every decision they make on the field is to be reflective of the book that's been handed from the kingdom that they are to represent. You and I belong to another kingdom. Let's represent the kingdom. So I want you to understand this thing for the last couple of years I've been talking to the church about, about having a biblical worldview is not a new idea. <laughs> It's been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, just for a little bit of historical reference, that video of, uh, of Dr. Evans uh, was, was not recent. That's from eight years ago when Mr. Obama was running against uh, Mr. Romney. And uh, this, this uh, push toward the church to wake the church up to see biblical things is something that's been going on. Uh, actually for quite some time. And I love the NFL analogy. It's excellent, uh, except the fact that, you know, the only downside to that uh, is, you know, I wish we were the refs because <laughs> I'd love to blow the whistle and, and throw some of them out of the game. <laughs> and so I don't really have that, that power. But we do indeed call balls and strikes, so to speak, in a spiritual sense, all right? And... Uh, bring up Joshua 5. This is a reference to the verse that he was talking about. When the captain of the host came, he did in fact say nay. But as captain of the host of the Lord, I, uh, I am, excuse me, of the Lord, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Now here's what you need to know. Uh, the question is not who is, whose side God's on. That's not the question. The question is, who is on God's side? Because that's what matters. The only side ultimately that matters that's going to prevail is God's side. And political parties come and go and they change names and evolve and do all kinds of things. And, and, and none of that matters because there isn't an issue of which party is right. It is, it, it is an issue of... but. Who is aligning themselves up more so than others uh, with God's side? That's, that's what we're, we're after. Turns out that the captain of the host of the Lord did in fact fight on Joshua's behalf. Not because he had come to fight for Joshua, but because he had come to fight for God's cause. Just so happens Joshua was representing accurately God's cause. And that's what caused God to respond, and that's why the angel of the, of the Lord responded, because Joshua was on that right side. We are ultimately not of this earth. Now, we, we obviously are as humans and so forth, but as people that have been born again of water and spirit, we are part of another kingdom. We have dual citizenship. And one is a spiritual kingdom, and we are ambassadors in this kingdom representing the other kingdom. That's why when it comes to politics or really just about anything else, our role is to learn more and more about our king and represent his values, uh, his ideas, uh, how he thinks on things. Uh, it's not about me trying to interject my logic into it all or my history or my legacy or any of that. Now, the pulpit is, I'm called to equip the saints, and that's what I'm trying to do with, with some of this teaching. And at the end of the day, I, I like how one organization said it. It said, we're just asking the people of God to do three things, pray, vote, and stand for what's right. And that's good. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking us to... Uh, 
you know, go out and protest everything and try to picket everything and make a, I'm, I'm not into all of that. I am not representing the donkey. I'm not representing the elephant either. We are here to represent the lamb. It's the lamb's agenda that, that we are after. So the question is, is there anybody in this whole political mess that, that is even remotely on the lamb's side? That's what we're trying to discern. Uh, so it's not about whether you feel good about the Democrat Party, you feel good about the Republican Party or the Green Party or whatever party comes and goes. That's not the issue. The issue is, is there anybody that's even near the Lamb's agenda? Now, the Lamb is not on the ballot. So the only choices we have is to try to choose the closest thing to the Lamb's agenda as we can. And it is never perfect. Never perfect. You see, politics is all about how groups of humans organize their affairs. And so we endeavor to apply Scripture to those principles. Human government, as we taught last week, is a biblical concept, and the Bible has much to say about civil government. It's amazing to me how many conversations I've had over the years with, with, with people of God sometimes that just think that the Bible, I, you know, I, I don't care what goes on, and, and I, it's got nothing to do with me. It's got, what book are you reading? All right, because the reality is the Bible has an incredible amount to say about civic government and civic life. There is a whole lot more in that book than Acts 2.38 and one God. <laughs> but sometimes we try to bury our head in the sand, just act like there's nothing else we need to worry about but trying to be right doctrinally about the new birth. There's a whole lot of other issues to, to discuss. As a matter of fact, in, in the Old Testament, God used the laws of a nation, the civic laws of a nation, Israel, that he founded, which basically is politics. <laughs> and he used politics and the whole political system of civil government as the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Yeah, I can tell I blew your mind with that one. <laughs> the entire Old Testament was, was about God's, the, the story of Israel and how God gave them laws that were holy laws, just laws. No other nation had laws like their laws. This was civic government that God put in. Now, he chose an incredible, incredible man to lead it all, the first politician that God put into place was a gentleman by the name of Moses. <laughs> you say, well, he came down with the law. Yeah, what was the law for? It was for the nation. <laughs> he was going to be a political leader. Now, he also had a dual role. He was a, a religious leader also. But in that initial uh, situation, and again, you understand what I'm trying to say. So the truth is, I am not a political activist. But I am engaged, and I am trying to pay attention to what is happening in two different kingdoms. I'm trying to pay attention to what's happening in our spiritual kingdom, and I'm trying to be sensitive to that and discern that, but I also got to keep an eye on what's going on in this natural kingdom that I'm a part of as well, because both of them affect my life. So there are biblical worldview issues that, that swerve directly into politics. They're not just religious issues. For example, uh, the, and, and, and I'm talking about, a, I'm just picking out a few. This isn't exhaustive. But it's the issues that the Bible has something to say about it. So somebody say, well, Pastor, I don't like it if you're going to talk on politics. I'm not talking on politics. I'm talking on Bible study. <laughs> I'm applying Bible to politics. This is a biblical study, not just a, uh, not just a civics lesson, even though that's kind of sounds like what we're doing tonight. But here's, here's why certain issues matter to me and other issues don't matter as much to me. Number one, uh, issues such as the sanctity of life uh, and abortion and so forth, especially taxpayer paid for abortion, those kind of things. That's, the Bible has a lot to say about that. It's not just Acts 2.38. Issues about family and marriage 
and sexuality and borders, believe it or not, border security. The Bible has a lot to say about border security. Gun rights. You say, what? <laughs> you realize how many, how many scriptures there are that talk to the Lord about taking up arms and, 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 and defending Israel and, you know, it, it's, it's all part of the book. Uh, all the issues of transgender stuff that's going on in there. Bible got a lot to say about that. <laughs> Poverty or, or staying out of it. Bible's got tons of things to say about poverty. Got tons of things to say about money management and so forth. And, and where that swerves into is taxes and regulations. Bible talks about all that stuff. Race relations. Bible has a lot to say about that. Uh, socialism versus liberty. Tons of stuff to say about it. And, and one of the things that swerves into that as a subtopic is things like, uh, that is the big thing of our time, socialized medicine. And so for all those things have biblical roots that we need to go into the book and find out what it has to say. Issues of freedom of speech, parental rights, which would fall into things like school choice and so forth. There's, there's, there's biblical things. This new thing that they're coming up, the Green New Deal. <laughs> uh, it ain't a good deal, I can tell you that. Uh, things like wars. Hey, the biggest one, Israel. I mean, the, the entire thing in the earth that God is dealing with outside of the church is Israel. So all of the political stuff, and he says to the founder of the nation, which was Abraham, he says to him, he says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to curse those that curse you, and I'm going to bless those that bless you. It's got a lot to say about it. Now, my point that I'm saying, I, and, and by the way, this isn't exhaustive. I'm just, I'm just pulling a few of them off, off the top. Uh, the Bible has views on all these issues of civil, civic affairs. It is not just Acts 2.38. So the church has every, not only right, the church has every obligation to explore these things and, and, and to see what the Scripture says. And so my obligation is, first of all, study to show myself approved as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed before the Lord. Then secondly, as a, as a Christian, I then, after study and after you know, figuring this out, I will lend my support and my vote to whoever is the closest thing I can find at any given time to a biblical worldview. It, it, and, and here's the thing. It doesn't matter who those people are necessarily. Because what we're talking about is, is policy things, directions, what, certain ideas. Ideas are not equal. Certain ideas point a certain way. Other ideas will take you down another path. And so we, gotta, we have to have a philosophy of government to understand what path we think is the right one and then try to, try to stand against anything that's, that's going to take us down a different kind of path. The, the problem is we are not supporting individual personalities. And it is, it's honestly comical to me how many people, uh, and, uh, church folks, but even aside from that, uh, there's all kinds of people, that are angry at church folks because some of them voted for a certain politician or another. Mm -hmm. Now, here, here's, here's why, this is what I mean when I say it's amusing to me, is that the, the, the question is, how could you vote for so-and-so or, or whatever? We're not voting about their personality or their antics or whatever. What we're looking for is policy projections. Dr. Evans, the same one that was in the video, has a message he even preaches on this. He calls it kingdom voting. You know, We're not voting for ourselves and our own ideas. We're voting for kingdom principles. We are not trying to create heaven on earth. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Closest thing might come to it is the millennial reign, and we're going to have to wait and see how that's going to unfold. 
Um, and, and, and so when I, in, in our time and day, when I hear extreme, uh, particularly extreme leftist politicians yapping and talking all day long about how we need to heal this division, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I get a little nauseated ha having to hear this over and over again because I'm sitting there thinking, it is your policies that is creating the division. If you really wanted to heal the division, then just sit down <laughs> and quit trying to change culture to fit your antichrist concepts. It's driven by a spirit of antichrist. I don't mean the individuals are antichrist. I don't even mean that there are some people that, I don't even mean that they're demon possessed. Some of them are. You know, I'm spirit possessed. I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and not everybody on, 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 on a biblical worldview has the Holy Ghost. Not everybody that is involved in the antichrist view of things is demon possessed. It's not about that. It's about, but, but, but concepts and philosophies are driven by spirit. And we have to discern what spirit is driving something in order to be able to discern, because a lot of things paint themselves, especially deceptions. Remember, in the last days, Paul said there would be uh, seducing spirits. Now, the way a seducing spirit operates is it paints itself as one thing, when in fact what it's doing is the exact opposite. And if you don't discern the spirit, you'll get caught up in, in just what the stated purpose is, only to wake up one day very embarrassed because you think, well, ruh -roh. <laughs> I didn't I didn't mean to support this. But we could have we could have saved a lot of that if we had been learning a biblical worldview and how to apply it to our life. Can you say amen? So we live in a time in American history right now where our nation, unfortunately, has become more and more uh, secular. And they're even calling this a post-Christian society. Uh, and numerically, it's, it's, it's probably so. But here's what happens. As a country gets less and less God-centered, further and further away, from biblical principles of any sort, then the people will tend to begin to value liberty less and less. Now that's a, that's a reality. That's a philosophical reality. The further we drift from biblical mores, culturally, the more we will value liberty less and less. And it's kind of a marvel in our, in, in our day how many people are willing to give up so much liberty uh, for a little sense of security. And you got to be careful because there's a line in there uh, that if you give up too much liberty to have security, you won't have either when it's all said and done. Now here's what happens in a secular culture. Without a God to look to because we were designed and made to worship. Everybody worships something. Even atheists. They just think they're above it all, but they're not. We're created by God to hunger for something bigger than us. And the truth of the matter is, during the course of our life, we often need something bigger than us to lean upon. Now, if you don't have a God that you can lean to, the, 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 the next biggest thing, what's the biggest thing that you can think of uh, in America? Well, uh, it's the government. And so the more and more people that start looking toward the government to be God, then they begin to make the government bigger and bigger and bigger because they need to make their God bigger and bigger and bigger because when they lean on their God, they find out their God goofs up. <laughs> and their God makes mistakes and things fall through the cracks. And, and so we're going to fix that by making the program even bigger. <laughs> and government is so huge today compared to even what it was when I was a boy. And then if you go back to my grandparents' day, it, 
you know, it, it's just grown exponentially. And I think it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger because people are subconsciously trying to make the government fill the role of a God that they don't have. People that have a God don't need the government as much. You know, I mean, great, if there's a program I can do something, but I'm not dependent on that. I, my, my world is not going to collapse if the U.S. government doesn't come through with something or another because that's not my provider. My, my provider is the Lord God. Amen. So, and, and here's what happens with nothing. Uh, people try to apply directions uh, through all this toward to, to government and so forth. And then what happens is we want, to, we want the government to solve all of our problems by taking away as many risks of life as possible. And people try to apply uh, di directions to the church uh, and instead of the church to the government. Somebody is going to make a way. Now, so here's what happens. With nothing greater to look to, the trend towards socialism and ultimately communism continues to march because the ultimate size of government is communism. Socialism is just a half step under it. And we keep thinking we want more and more and more of that. Well, you do unless you have a God that you can depend on. And so America, uh, oh, and by the way, the result of all of this is political freedoms begin to erode. And they erode because they're given up in favor of political correctness. I want to give up what, what is a birthright to me in order that I can just fit in with culture and society. Now, at the current time in our history, America has, is a two-party system. I'm not arguing for it or against it. It is what it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think sometimes having a third party would be great, and at times there has been uh, some that have tried to start up, but they can't get enough traction uh, because the two-party system has things pretty much strangleholded right now. Um, and these parties change and evolve over time. And so you have to judge a party really almost decade by decade because they do shift and change because it depends on the people that drift into them and the people that drift out of them. Our job, uh, again, as the people of God, is not promoting the donkey or the elephant. Again, it's promoting the lamb's agenda. Now, in, in reality, I identify with a biblical worldview. When I've studied the Word and I've examined it with these civil, uh, civic issues and so forth, I have come to the conclusion that that makes me, by definition in our day, that makes me a political conservative. Now, I didn't create the term. I just figured out what they're describing and, that's, oh, yeah, that's me. I'm a political conservative. Now, I am not one because I was born one. I am one because I concluded that my biblical worldview and study led me there. And it only, not because conservatism is necessarily perfect. It's just it's the closest thing that I can find to biblical truths as far as civil government goes. Now, uh, so therefore, I will... Uh, I will support whichever party or candidate happens to be as close as possible to my views of things. I don't care, honestly, if they're a Democrat or a Republican uh, or, or whatever. I, I really don't care because that's not what I'm promoting. I'm promoting a philosophy, a biblical philosophy, and I'll back whoever is doing that with me. If I can find somebody, if I got two candidates or two parties and one of them is, is backing a biblical worldview about 50% of the time and the other one's only backing it about 25% of the time, then I'm going to lend my support and vote to the one that's doing it the most because no one is doing it perfectly, nor can they, nor will they. Now, the reality is, now I know this is going to sound like a, uh, like a real controversial statement, but really it's not. It is simple history and reality. All right, Here's the reality in our day, in, in 2020, 
as of tonight. Over the last 40 years, I said people drift in and out of parties. Um, Non-religious secularists have been gathering and assembling more and more in the Democratic Party, much more than the Republican Party. Now, they're in both, but they're, they've been assembling more and more and more in a direction. And the reason for that is because 40 years ago or so, the Democratic Party kicked the doors of the barn wide open and invited uh, just about anything in. And because they wanted to win. Now, that's the, really the root of political parties, by the way. They just want to win. <laughs> you know. And they'll, they'll, they'll cheat their own mother <laughs> in order to win. <laughs> and they don't care you know, about it because, because many of them are not philosophically driven. They're power driven. Okay. Now, what happened is the party opened the door to, to extreme radicals, leftists, radicals. And they did it for votes. Okay, now here's the thing. Uh, some of the party leaders realize they've made a mistake. But, and, and they're even trying to fix it now, do something with it. But here's the problem. They, they let the monster in the house. <laughs> and the monster started getting more and more support. And right now, there is a civil war going on within the Democratic Party trying to figure out who's going to lead it. Is it going to be this, this leftist extreme stuff that's being pushed by the younger generation? Or, you know, the elders are trying to, you know, tap it down a little bit. And some of them, for the sake of power, are feeling overwhelmed by it. And so they're buying into it themselves. Now, this is a train wreck that is happening. It's, it's like watching a train wreck slowly unfold. Now, by the way, the Republican Party has a similar problem that's been going on over the past 30, 40 years as well, but it's a different, it's kind of on the other side. As non-religious secularist people have been drifting more and more and more into the Democratic Party, into it has diluted it, you know, its values and its platforms, or so has religious people have been drifting more and more in numbers toward the Republican Party. Now, that's just a historical fact. That's, there's nothing controversial about that. Uh, both parties would acknowledge that and tell you that. And what we're seeing right now in the last year or two is an amazing switch that's happening. There are many, 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 and you're not hearing a lot about this in the news, that people that are leaving the Democratic Party, that, and, and many, some of them are religious in nature, and they're finally saying, I, enough is enough. I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. You know, there's a couple of counties in Pennsylvania. And again, you won't hear this reported because the media has their own agenda. And unfortunately, it's a leftist agenda because it's all spirit driven. So they're not going to tell you the, the, the stuff that's happening behind the scenes. But right now, there's two counties. It's either two or three counties in Pennsylvania. I was reading a report just the other day that fascinated me because I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Is upstate Pennsylvania. And the Democrats have outnumbered the Republicans two to one in registration in those counties for the last 30 or 40 years. They have not elected a Republican in those counties in like 40, 50 years. Right? It's, a, it's a Democratic stronghold. But what's been happening over the last year or so, more and more people are going in and switching their party affiliation from Democrat to Republican. And now for the first time in the history of the last, well, not history, but in the last 40 years or so, there are now more registered Republicans in that county than there are uh, Democrats. Now, we, I don't know exactly how that's going to unfold on November 3rd. But I, if you're going to go to the trouble <laughs> to change your party affiliation, I'm assuming you're, you're feeling inspired enough to get involved in, in voting. So we'll see. Uh, but, but here's the problem. Here's, here's why it's been happening. And, and by the way, there's a lot of people in the Republican Party that don't like it. They don't like that church folks have, have taken up residence w within their party. They, they, they're upset about it. And, 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 you know, it was the Tea Party movement that started a few years back, and, and they didn't like it. They, they fought against it. They didn't want it. So both parties have the same problem. It's just kind of different people that are, that are doing it. 
and uh, <laughs> it's really interesting to, to watch it all unfold. And 2020, when we started 2020, you remember uh, Brother Grimsley was here. He was prophesying about 2020 is going to be a year of clarity. And all of us were feeling it. I preached a message New Year's about 2020 vision. Everybody I knew was preaching the same thing. We all were feeling the same thing. This is a year of vision, 2020 vision. God's going to show us things. I got, now I got to tell you. <laughs> This is not what I had in mind. <laughs> and it's, it, what's happened is it, it wasn't anywhere on my radar. <laughs> but as we sit here in September, where we are, October. <laughs> right? We're not, yeah, we're in October. <laughs> as we sit here in October, it's occurring to me. You know, it's a... What's happening is exactly what God said was going to happen. I thought he was just talking about the church, but he wasn't. He was talking about the whole thing. And here's what's happening. All of this, this extreme, I mean, 2020 has been extremism on display. And we're all marveling at, now, if you have discerned the spirit, you're not so much shocked of, of, of what's really coming out of these people because we just people of discernment saw that 20 years ago the, the, but what's, what is shocking to us is how they have thrown all concern to the wind <laughs> and they're just brassy as anything about it and in your face about it and, well what's happening is more and more people are getting clarity because a lot of people, unfortunately, m too many people, do not spiritually discern like they need to be. And many people are, don't have enough Holy Ghost to even to discern. They, they're leaning on the church to do it. But here's what's happening. Most of your average, you know, kind of Joe regular kind of guy who doesn't really have a, a dog in the fight either way is seeing this and going... And there's clarity coming. There's vision coming. 2020 really is a year of clarity. Now, I wish you would hurry up and get over. <laughs> and people are seeing more and more what spirits drive things. Now, I would tell you this, don't believe all the polls that you're hearing. Uh, my my, my kind of sense, my spidey sense is Mr. Trump is going to not only win next month, I think he's going to win in bigger numbers uh, than he won the last time. And I think there is going to be an amazing rattling that's going to take place. Uh, now, we'll see, you know. But it's interesting that they're saying, no, 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 he's behind, Mr. O'Brien. Well, that was what was happening four years ago. Everybody kept saying that. Let me tell you about polls. Polls are oftentimes propaganda because they're easy to manipulate. You can manipulate a poll by how you, answer, how you ask the question, what kind of question you ask, who you ask. And, and if you get a majority of people that you know kind of lean your direction and poll them and come out and say, yeah, so it's polls don't really tighten up and start telling you the truth until about one week out. <laughs> because all the polling companies that have been agenda driven don't want to be embarrassed by being off course, uh, which is what happened to them last time. So what you'll see right at the end, you'll see this surge that comes up in the polls. Well, there was no surge. This has been happening for the last year. So don't pay attention to that. Uh, you'll find out that it, it actually turns out oftentimes uh, to be something else. So a little civic lesson here. Uh, the current party registration stats in America. Uh, the Democratic Party is 31% uh, of Americans are registered as Democrats. 25% uh, are registered as Republicans. Now, there's another, oh, and 41% and are registered as independents. Now, here's the thing. Uh, 
just because you're registered independent doesn't mean that you, you don't lean toward one or the other here. So what, what they're saying is, is that up to 50% of the nation leans, tends to lean toward uh, democratic issues and about 38% they say auto lean toward, in other words, automatically. You, you can kind of count on that, that sort. So here's, here's what happens is that most elections, as you've heard it said, are not really decided by the people that are typically pretty consistent and partisan. It's, it's decided by the smaller, uh, well, I say smaller group, they're actually technically a big group, but, but when you weed out the auto ones, you know, the auto leaners, one that goes either way, uh, it's a smaller group. And so every, every election is really, de really dependent on those, what, what their mood is, you know, and which way they go. Interestingly, and I thought this was kind of fascinating, even though the Democratic Party has 50% uh, leaning that direction and the Republicans only have an automatic 38% leaning their direction, ironically, right now, as of, as of, as of today, uh, if you count all the politically elected seats of government from local, state, and federal and add them all up, it's thousands of offices. Right now, the uh, Republicans actually hold 53% of all elected offices in the nation, and the Democrats hold 47%, which I find that kind of interesting. And, and you can't count Nebraska because Nebraska, it's kind of a long story, but they have a different system out there, and, and they don't register by Democrat or Republican. So when you see ma matter of fact, speaking of maps, bring them up. Uh, slide four. Just, just real quick, this is just for interest's sake. Uh, this is the 2016 presidential map, um, red and blue states. So the, the blue states are Democratic, how, uh, states that went Democratic. Uh, the red states are those that went uh, Republican, went for Trump versus Hillary. Um, bring, up, uh, slide, bring up slide five, the next one. This is interesting. This is as of the end of last year. This is uh, governorships. This is how the nation's states, states are, are, are being led. Uh, bring up the next slide. This is the uh, state, uh, state houses. Now, state houses are incredibly important because that really gets down to more nitty-gritty. A lot of times state houses and state offices affect us more than federal does. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that right now with some of the mess we put into Richmond in this last election. And, uh, and I'm, I'm embarrassed by some of the stuff they have done, but we don't have time to get into all of that. But, I, but you can see a picture uh, of it there. Now, here, here's the reality. It used to be that there was not a huge amount of difference between the parties. Uh, and it used to be, and I think that that's why five decades ago, the church and religious people were kind of pulling out of the political realm because, you know, we're going to live above that. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to keep everything private. We're not going to say much. We're not, you know, well, the truth of the matter is back then there wasn't a whole lot to stand for because they really weren't all that different. If you want to see something interesting, and you can Google this, it's on YouTube. I watched a few minutes of it the other night, just part of my research for all this. But uh, if you go back to 1958, and the first televised presidential debate was between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. And it was the first time it was ever televised. And, and you can see it. It's black and white. <laughs> but, but watch it. It's interesting. It take a few minutes and, and look at it. And, and what's fascinating is they say, historians say, that was a major shift in America. Because the truth of the matter is there wasn't a huge, huge difference between JFK and Nixon. At the time, there were some policy different, but not a huge amount. As a matter of fact, if if uh, if they resurrected JFK today, based on his policies in in the early '60s before he was killed, and applied him today, I promise you, he wouldn't be a Democrat. His policies would be more Republican. So you know, again, because parties change, you know, this stuff shifts. It's like a pendulum swinging back and forth. So you, so the, the, you can't judge it historically. You got to judge it. What is it now? Okay, that's the point. Um, but now they say that Nixon actually won the debate on a contest, 
a content point. However, he greatly lost it. As a matter of fact, the uh, JFK was elected, and, and they said if you were listening on the radio, you would have thought Nixon won. But if you watched it on TV, you would have realized Kennedy won <laughs> because Kennedy was young and vibrant and sharp and handsome. And Nixon, they said, had a five o'clock shadow. He looked a little disheveled. <laughs> And uh, and he was older than than JFK, and, and it, you know, it just, he didn't have the TV persona. And quite frankly, at the time, they didn't realize how impacting that was going to be. But they uh, historians say that really JFK won the election because of the image that he had on television. Since that time, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. <laughs> Everything's about image now. It's about image. It's not about character. It's not about truth. It's not about what you really stand for or what you really believe. It's what kind of image I can project. Because whether for good or bad, that's the reality that we live in. And so the point is, in today's world, there is huge differences between the directions of the party and the media is not really being honest enough to tell you the truth about it. Religious freedom is under tremendous attack. Uh, has been for the last 20 years. Uh, and, and we're seeing the battle that's unfolding in the Supreme Court. Even right now with, uh, with the, the nomination of uh, Amy uh, Barrett, uh, I mean, you, you're, you're going to see it. They're, they're coming out with the claws. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy because they're fighting for something. I, I'll tell you personally what I think is happening. I think that God is having some mercy on America. I think people are praying and even though the nation itself has gotten more secular, but the religious people are starting to become more concerned and more prayerful. And do you know that just not this weekend, but weekend prior, there were over 50,000 people that were in Washington, D.C. in big prayer rallies praying a repentance for America and pray. The, new, the, main, the leftist-oriented news coverages wouldn't hardly give it a dime. Matter of fact, one commentator cracked me up. He had a, he had a display on it. It came up and said, did you hear about 50,000 Christians that were in Washington over the weekend and, and destroyed the city and left it littered and everything else? And I was thinking, no, I didn't hear that. And when you open up the article, it says, no, you didn't hear about it because it didn't happen. <laughs> but there was 50,000 people. In Washington, not to mention that, there were many of us that didn't go that were praying. Uh, Brother Austin, I think, Joe, were you there? Yeah. Did you go up to that? I heard you were going. Okay, didn't make it. Uh, but, you know, we had a lot of people, 50 grand worth, <laughs> that, that went up. And you have to understand something. Much of the chaos that has been foisted upon our land did not come through the political system. It came through the courts. The courts did this. Activist judges did this. They forced things on us that the legislatures didn't, didn't do. In our system of government, the law should be established by legislature and then enacted by the executive branch, and then the courts are supposed to be separate and just call balls and strikes and make sure that both uh, the other branches are adhering to the Constitution. Now, that's how it was supposed to work. Do you know... But here's what's ironic. Even in a, in, a, in a secular culture like we have, a lot of this extreme agenda stuff doesn't, can't get in legislatively. Do you know that just a couple of years ago, I think it was, California, of all places, it's known as the most liberal state among us. Do you know that in California they put gay marriage on the, on the agenda for the people of California to vote on, whether to approve it or not approve it, and they voted it down? <laughs> California. A majority of the state of California said no. Then a few days after that, a federal judge decided that he knew better than the electorate and he overturned it and called their vote unconstitutional. This is the problem that we're having in the nation. That's how a lot of this stuff, that's how gay marriage got put upon us. That's how uh, all this, you know, get, get rid of the nativities and the Ten Commandments and all, all of this stuff has come through the courts. It has not come through the people. That's why courts matter. And Mr. Trump won back in 2016 predominantly because of his promise to 
largely appoint originalist judges. And the truth is, people that voted for him didn't know whether he would do it or not. Because we're so used to politicians lying. And people that voted for Trump from, from a, a Christian worldview concept took a huge gamble because we, we didn't know whether he would. And quite frankly, uh, it has paid off in spades because he has been an incredible blessing to the church in America. And one of the things that he is doing is appointing an incredible amount of judges. Now, the reason is because he's going to uh, judges that have been vetted for their view of the Constitution. We want judges that don't think that the Constitution is a living document that changes. and, and keep, No, it goes back to what the founders meant. Uh, the founders, when they were writing the Constitution, did not put gay marriage in it. But courts decided that it's a living document. It now applies, and that's how they fit stuff in. So we're not trying to put judges on the court that have preset opinions. We're simply trying to put judges on the court that will, that will argue original intent of the Constitution to protect the land. And that's why courts matter. Do you know, and this is fascinating, a little history here. When Mr. Obama left office in 2016... He left 128 judgeships open, federal judgeships. One of the great things presidents gets to do is nominate judges. But the reason that he, well, part of the reason that he left them was because they didn't have control of the Senate. And again, elections matter. And so since the Senate has to confirm, they were not confirming a lot of his choices because he was tending to choose justices that would be more toward his ideas of, of things that are more leftist. And so the, the Senate wouldn't do it. So he just decided, he just stopped messing with it. And they walked out of office with 128 judgeships open because the assumption was they were so sure Hillary was going to win, the agreement was that she'll handle all of that when she gets in the office. <laughs> and then Trump won. That's why that night... They were screaming and carrying on and starting fires and flipping cars. And Hillary was so upset and had a fit and couldn't even come down to greet voters and stuff. That's why, listen, when conservative people lose, we don't, you know, we'll, we'll re, we're disappointed, you know, maybe even a little depressed. <laughs> but we'll regroup. We'll, we'll keep fighting. We'll, you know, we'll believe the Lord. Because, again, government isn't our God. You see, we, we have a God. So our world doesn't collapse just because we don't get our way sometimes. But if government's your God, and it's the only thing you have to look to to, 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 to do things your way, oh, man, when it doesn't work, it, things go crazy. And so they have had a four-year conniption fit. That's what my mom used to call it. By the way, that's a real word. Conniption. It means rage. Speaking of that, it's a Bible word, too. Psalms 2, bring it up. I only have a few minutes left. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why are they acting like this? Here's why. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we want rid of this biblical influence. We want rid of Christianity. We want, rid, we wanna, we want pastors to shut up. We want churches to be quiet. We, we just do your own religion thing, but, but stay out of the public square. Because they've taken counsel against the anointed. They've taken counsel against the thing. See, my point is, everything you're seeing is Bible study. It is biblical. We absolutely should be talking about it and studying it. Let us break their bands. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 4. And he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. And the Lord shall have them in derision, and then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. At some point, God always says enough. 
and he resets things. Now, I personally think that this is a little bit of what's happened. I think we have some mercy of God that is coming upon our land because what has happened in the last three years, Mr. Trump has not only filled all 228 of those judgeships, he is now, as of this month, has filled uh, uh, over uh, right at 300 federal judgeships across the nation. It is historically unprecedented. And the political left knows and, and, and are falling apart over it. Because they're upset. And if, if this nomination goes through here this month, he'll have his third Supreme Court justice in just three years. You have to understand something. That is, that's unprecedented. There are presidents that have been president for eight-year terms that only got to do one, maybe two. There's a few that never got to appoint any. And he is getting to appoint three. And if he wins another four years, there is a high possibility, because two more of them are in their uh, mid-80s, there's another possibility that he could do more. It, it, is, it, is a, it is a phenomenal thing that's happening. And what you should be seeing in it is not Trump or the party, or whatever, what you and I as the people of God should be seeing is the hand of the Lord that's working in the midst of all of this. The reason that Garland, uh, you know, Mr. Obama appointed Garland Merrick, I think is, is his name, and from all everything I've heard about him, he's a great guy. He's a good judge, but his problem was he has a different worldview. His worldview is not, an, not originist. And, and so since the Senate had control, they were able to say no in that last year before the election. And when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, and it was almost, it was really comical to me when, when they announced that her deathbed wish was that, you know, the next president would be able to point. Well, okay, that's fine, but that's not how we operate. We have a constitution. <laughs> it is not her seat. It is not her. This belongs to the people. Okay. And so that's just emotional hyperbole. Doesn't mean anything. And for the last 50 years, the courts have routinely ruled against churches. Started with school prayer, abortion rights, gay marriage, religious symbols on properties, nativity scenes, crosses, Ten Commandments. They have the courts. It's always the courts. It's not the legislatures. People aren't voting for this. It's being crammed down our throat by activist judges. That's why the courts have to change. And that's why it takes time for this to all unfold. Because they've pitted the church against the state. And government has become a Christian antagonist. It's interesting that in the last three years or so, 2017, 18, and 19, there were three major Supreme Court victories that were won on behalf of religious freedom. They were critical. Some of you remember the Christian Baker, you know, and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, they, they got upset because he didn't want to make a cake for a gay couple. Well, there were plenty of other bakers that would do it. it would, they were just trying to prove a point. And by the way, they had films where they went into a Muslim-owned bakery, and they said no. <laughs> but they didn't do anything to them. The Muslims wouldn't do it either, you know, <laughs> because Christians are the problem, because you have to understand what spirit drives this stuff. This is not political stuff. This is spiritual stuff. And so all three of these court cases, uh, it had to do with gay marriage, uh, r religious symbols, couple, uh, well, not, I'm sorry, not gay marriage. It was the bakeries. It was Hobby Lobby. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the medical issues and all that. Anyway, here, here's what's, what happened. In those three cases, interestingly, the Supreme Court voted 7-2 to two in favor of the religious liberty on all three of them. It was a gr great victory. Now, the reason that's happening is because, again, the court is beginning to change. Originalists are beginning to get put on the, on the seats more effectively. And the interesting thing that was consistent about all three of the major votes in the last three years, the two justices that stood against every one of the religious principles, religious freedom principles, is uh, Sotomayor 
and uh, Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a fascinating lady. She certainly has a fascinating life story, and we can we can applaud that. But she was not uh, a a champion of religious freedom. She was not. She was the face. Uh, she was the legal face of abortion in America, because when you hear her, how they say she was a champion of women's rights. Well, see, that's deceptive. Because there's not a lot of people against women's rights. <laughs> There's nobody I know of running against women's rights. When they say she was a champion of women's rights, what they're saying is she was a champion of abortion on demand. Mm -hmm. Because she argued that, that, that only the woman should have the ability to make that decision. And so she stood against all this stuff. And so now that she's out of that role, if, if Coney uh, Barrett goes into that role, here she is. She is a... from all accounts from everything I've read, an incredible stellar judge, but she comes from a different worldview, more of an originalist worldview. And so she will judge on things differently. She's going to go back to the original Constitution. And here she is, a mother of seven, two of them adopted from Haiti. And uh, it's amazing to see how they're trying to rip her apart. They started this stuff back in the 70s with Bork, Judge Bork. You know, that, that was even known. He got Borked. That literally meant you got railroaded politically. And they've been doing it ever since. And it, was, it happened to Gorsuch. It happened to Kavanaugh. What happened to Judge Kavanaugh was unbelievable. Unbelievable what happened to him. And it's going to be interesting. They're going to have to be real careful how they do it with, 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 with Barrett because... You know, they're going to have to be careful what they, what they call her. But the reason that all this rage is going on is because the power that they have used to promote antichrist stuff and anti-biblical stuff is being slowly taken from them. That's why the heathen rage. They took counsel against God, and God is starting to do something about it. Amen. Well, I'm out of time. <laughs> Not out of notes. So we'll probably have one more part of this, and then we'll go to, we'll get back to our end time de deception stuff. Though, be honest with you, really, I think some of this is end time de deception stuff. Stand with me. Hallelujah. Praise God. By the way, did you notice uh, in the debate the other night, uh, it was just amazing to me, you know, because the political left is now saying, well, we're losing that battle, but we'll pack the court. We'll just add new Supreme Court justices. Do you know we've had nine justices for over, I think it's over 100 years. The number works fine. <laughs> As a matter of fact, adding judges doesn't mean that you're going to get more work done. It probably actually would slow work down uh, because they judge things together not just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but they asked him, they asked Mr. Biden in debate, would he say right up front that he's not going to do that? He wouldn't even answer the question. He literally said, I'm not going to answer the question. I thought, whoa. That's been... And he said, because if I answer the question, he said, that'll become the issue. And I thought, yep, that's right. <laughs> but by not answering the question, he did answer the question. If you discern the spirit of it. Amen. In Jesus' name, Father, I loose this teaching and this discussion into the hearts of your people. God, it's, a, it's the responsibility of this pulpit to help equip us to deal with the world in which we live in. And I'm asking you to help us learn deeper and deeper about a biblical worldview and how to apply it to our world. We give you the praise and glory in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. And clap your hands to the Lord. And one last time, give him a shout of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. We're going to have a great day with Brother Hal. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Those online, thank you for watching tonight and being a part of it. We'll see you.